In the U.S. state of Texas, a controversial immigration law has been put back on hold by a federal appeals court. That, hours after the Supreme Court lifted a temporary stay, allowing state and local police to begin arresting people suspected of illegally entering the country. Legal challenges to the law are continuing with opponents warning it would lead to racial profiling and rights violations. Republicans in Texas and beyond have accused the Biden administration of not taking action on immigration. Two years ago, Texas's governor began sending new arrivals on buses to other cities around the U.S. Tens of thousands headed to Denver in central state of Colorado. DW's Benjamin Alvarez Gruber met people there doing what they can to accommodate the new arrivals. Located far from the U.S. southern border, Denver was not directly impacted by irregular migration until a political decision changed that. In May of 2023, the governor of Texas, Greg Abbott, announced that he would start busing migrants to Denver, the fifth city that he's been targeted to raise awareness about the immigration problems that Texas is facing. As a result, tens of thousands of migrants arrived in Colorado's capital. City officials said that in the past year, Denver received more migrants per capita than any other major city outside Texas. It's always been a slow trickle that could be integrated. And this time, all of a sudden, 40,000 appeared in months. That's, a, that's like a whole other city. The buses from Texas weren't willing to work with us. They weren't willing to drop off at set locations. People were just kind of dumped around the city. Many migrants ended up in encampments on the street. Seeing the desperate situation, Elizabeth decided to get involved. I'm actually doing something that makes a difference. Here I can make a positive change, even if it's only one person at a time. In small groups, migrants come down here to get clothing or sanitary products donated by members of the community. That's also how Andrea got involved. So we just pulled over and like my little kids started handing bananas to other little kids their own age. But like people without shoes and no coats and like it's November in Colorado and nobody has what they need and everyone's asking me for work. And I like quickly realized they need a lot more than bananas. Soon after, Andrea's house became a distribution point for donations brought by moms from the neighborhood. That led to a new idea. The mother of three started a Facebook group called Highland Moms and Neighbors that attracted more than 7,000 volunteers to help migrants, like here in a Denver church that houses migrants. What's tonight? Soup? Chicken noodle soup? Delicious. That sounds really good, actually. Andrea says she and the Highland moms and neighbors are happy to help as many migrants as they can here. But she would like to see governments and nonprofits with better resources and more experience doing the job they are expected to do. The problem is that because our immigration system doesn't work and there's no plan, so they're opening the door to thousands and thousands and thousands of people who genuinely need help and who want to work and just not be dependent on anyone. They're not looking for handouts. I have to like force coats and shoes on people. They want work. They don't want, they want to be able to pay for their own stuff. I say this a lot and I mean it not disrespectfully, but on, honestly, like whoever's in charge of immigration policy in this country needs to step aside, maybe go have a snack, clean your room and let the moms do it. Like we, 48 hours and this could be fixed. Denver has spent more than $36 million helping migrants. Residents in neighboring Lakewood say that's too much. Recently, hundreds of them gathered for a town hall meeting to raise concerns about overwhelmed hospitals and infrastructure. The concern is, is that all of the neighboring municipalities were approached to help with the situation in Denver. They want us, all of us, to take um, a role in housing and feeding and services. Um, people are reluctant to get engaged here, particularly when the city and when, when the government really is not asking how you feel about this. This needs to have public discussion and that had not happened. Ramey Johnson moderated the town hall meeting. She says officials underestimated the situation. But I think what happened is that the mayor of Denver really got caught off guard with the number that was coming and the amount of finances and money it was going to take to provide for their services. Denver Mayor Mike Johnston's office did not respond to interview requests. 
In February, the mayor announced temporary cuts to some city services to fund the immigration response, a decision that increased the already existing tensions. Now that conversation and that um, dynamic has created us versus them in Denver, where um, prior to that, I didn't hear that. Prior to that, I had um, tons of people wanting to help and stepping into that space of filling the gap where government couldn't. Now that some of our rec recreation centers are closing, um, have limited hours, and our motor vehicle centers have limited hours, yes, now I'm hearing like, well, what about us? The humanitarian crisis in Denver drastically changed Sandoval's work. Instead of waiting for others, she took matters into her own hands and managed to pull $345,000 from other council members to get migrant children off the city streets and into apartments. She says it's a structural problem. If all the, the 40,000 newcomers who had come from Central America, mostly Venezuela or Central America, if they had come with work authorization, would we be having this conversation? Probably not. But many fear that this increasingly politicized conversation with an upcoming presidential election and a radicalized discourse on migration in the United States will only get more heated, pushing a fair humanitarian solution further out of reach. I'd like to bring in an uh, expert on all things uh, U.S., William Glucroft. Uh, William, with a presidential election on the horizon, how do you foresee the discourse on immigration evolving? Evolving or devolving, I guess, is the question. I think um, that last line in the report really summed it up. You have this presidential election this year, and often issues just become talking points, policy talking points, uh, when there's a, a campaign to win. Uh, the, the issue on immigration has been devolving in the United States for a very long time. I don't think there's been any kind of real, real reform or movement on the immigration issue since maybe Ronald Reagan in the 1980s, which goes back to when I was in diapers. And many other people these days can't even remember or weren't even around. And since then, it's really just been a cudgel to, you know, hit the other side with Democrats against Republicans, Republicans against Democrats, depending on whoever has been in power. And there's been almost, you know, a rise in deportations and a rise in irregular migration almost consistently. It's, you know, uh, fluctuated a bit, but almost consistently from presidential administration to presidential administration, which brings us to Donald Trump. We saw how he the rhetoric he used, the highly um, divisive and uh, angry and hateful uh, rhetoric he used against migrants or uh, presumed migrants in the 2016 campaign. Uh, so we can imagine much more of that happening now uh, in 2024. It's been used very effectively by him, for his, at least for his voter base. Uh, and on the other side, Joe Biden is trying to, to kind of promote his credentials on immigration, but mm. it's a weak spot for him in the polls um, going into going into the, the general campaign season. So a controversial law on immigration has been put back on hold by a federal appeals court just hours after the Supreme Court gave it the green light. Now, that might be confusing to some viewers, not quite attuned to the dynamic nature of the American court system. Tell us how that's possible and what essentially happened. It's actually confusing to many legal scholars who, who do this for a living. Many of them are saying, regardless of where you come down on this issue, should this law go forward or not, that what they're calling uh, legal whiplash is just not good for the, the legal and political system in the United States. It's not, uh, it's not common to see this amount of back and forth between different courts in such a short order. Of course, the United States, like many countries, have many layers of courts. You have district courts, you have appeals courts, then of course you have the Supreme Court. And in the United States, being a federal system, you have state level courts and federal level courts, depending on whether a law is a state issue or a federal issue. In this case, it's a federal issue because immigration law is federal law. The federal government has the legal right and responsibility to patrol borders and secure the borders. And Texas is essentially, so goes the accusation, is violating or undermining federal law, which is inherently unconstitutional because in the United States, the federal government has supremacy. It's called the supremacy doctrine of supremacy law that no state law can supersede federal law. They have the, the final say uh, when it comes to matters affecting the entire country. 
So that's what this is really about. This is a constitutional issue. It's not really, although, you know, um, ACLU, migration groups, these kinds of people are, are arguing the human rights side, the humanitarian side. Really, this is a legal issue about the constitutionality of mm -hmm. whether Texas can enforce its own immigration law over federal law. So much more I'd like to chat with you about, but we will have to end it there. Our thanks, as always, to DW's William Glucroft.